slowly orbiting at the edge of deep space 1,000 kilometers beyond 21st century Earth is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. Here, Star Lab Research Director Dr. Maura Cassidy and scientists and technicians of the International Space Authority watch over the countless star systems that fill the universe. This week, a fugitive from a dead planet draws Star Lab into the final battle of an interplanetary war of destruction and deceit, forcing Dr. Cassidy and the ISA to confront a question of conscience on alien worlds. This is Star Lab. Go ahead, Solaris. We're on our way back in, Jerry. ETA, three hours, 15 minutes. Give or take a few weeks. <laughs> That's what I like about you, buddy. Always such a stickler for details. What can I say? Class shows in everything we do. Mm-hmm. So, uh, how about that freighter bound for Thanatos? Did you ever find out what the problem was? The captain sounded a bit vague. Well, it seems the captain signed on a crew of Semenians. So? You mean they just stopped working right in the middle of the flight? You got it. So it was up to us to tow the ship to the nearest spaceport. There the captain can wait out in Malacara. After all, we wouldn't want them falling into the sun or ramming the moon or something. It just ruins the view. I see. Well, as long as you're in such a charitable mood, uh, perhaps you could do me a favor and make one more stop on your way in? <laughs> Not exactly. I've been picking up some erratic Sigma class radio signals from Sector 9 or 5. I'd like you guys to check it out. Consider it done, Jerry. We'll let you know if we find anything interesting. Great. Oh, and uh, before I forget, there is just one last little thing. What's that? Well, that corned beef sandwich sounds really good. If it wouldn't be too much trouble, you think you Sorry, could... Jerry. Malakara, remember? This is our day off. Maybe next time. Solar is clear. Star Lab clear. Funny, they don't look so many. Huh? One hour later, the Solaris comes to a stop, 500 yards from a small, needle-shaped craft hanging motionless against the star-shot curtain of deep space. Well, there she is. What do you make of it? Well, the design looks pretty standard, but those markings... I've never seen pictographs quite like those before. And look at all that carbon scoring along the port side. Yeah. She's seen some action, all right. No sign of activity. Think it's a derelict? What about the distress signal? It might be automatic. Better run a tomography scan. Right. No good, Skip. She's shielded. Scanners just can't penetrate the hull. Well, so much for doing things the easy way. I think it might be a booby trap. Now, who'd want to rig a trap just to get little old us? Well, that depends. How many people do you know? <laughs> you have a point there. <laughs> well, I guess our only choice is to shoot across a magnetic grappler, bring her back to Star Lab for a once-over. Okay, let's do it. You better run grappler at maximum range, just to be safe. And if it is a trap? It's been real nice working with you, buddy. I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> Two hours later, the battle-scarred alien spacecraft is maneuvered into the outboard airlock of Isolab 7, where it's carefully lowered onto a brilliantly illuminated observation pad, located beneath a circular gallery of smoke-colored windows. Well, there it is, Phil. Your very first encounter with a genuine UFO. What do you think? Uh, it's different. The Academy certainly doesn't prepare you for anything quite like this. <laughs> That's why you're here, remember? You mean this isn't a transport bound for the Passion Planet? I never should have taken that left turn at St. Louis. <laughs> oh, well. So, what's next? Well, to start with, we've got to make a spectrographic analysis of the metals in the ship's hull. 
This will give us a picture of what materials make up its exterior and a, a rough idea about the kind of planet it came from. More. Look, it's opening. I see it. Seal the Isolab airlocks. Something's coming out at the base of the ship. There, do you see it? Oh my God. Medical team alert. Get a bioexamination chamber down to Isolab 7 as fast as you can. I've never seen anything like it before. A large reptilian alien rises to its feet, its scaled turquoise skin glimmering against the dull gray of the spacecraft. It stands holding a three-clawed hand against the bright viewing lights and then falls. <laughs> According to the report, he's been in a state of extreme oxygen deprivation for several weeks. They could only find scattered traces of oxygen in his entire bloodstream. How did he manage to survive? Probably by going into a kind of hibernation. As you can see, he's still in something of a comatose state. Hello, Dr. Cassidy. The time of non-life is over. You can understand us. Your language is not unknown in the universe. I am called Eason of Nakaresh. Nakaresh? I don't think I'm familiar with that system. And with good reason. For there are none left, save myself to speak of it. There was a war, a terrible war, between my planet and another. The reasons are no longer important. Both our worlds shared the same last breath, and now live no more. You mean the war left everyone on both sides dead? All safe too, yes. For as I survived, by chance so too did the last enemy battleship Urcus, which to this day preserves me. But what can they hope to accomplish? Nothing. Everything. It does not matter theirs is an unreasoning and irrational hate for my people that will not let them rest until the very last member of my race has been totally and utterly exterminated. Mora. Right here, Jerry. Go ahead. I'm picking up a ship five kilometers out. I think you better take a look at it. It's big. Real big. We're on our way. And so it begins again. Can you not hear them? I can. I can sense their presence. Yes, it is them. The enemy. They have found me at last. While investigating a distant distress signal, John and Buddy discover a battle-scarred alien spacecraft. Returning to Star Lab, a large reptilian alien crawls out of the ship, sways for a moment, then falls unconscious to the floor of Isolab 7. Later revived, the alien reveals that he is the last surviving member of a race totally annihilated during an interplanetary war. Suddenly, a second vessel, a giant crimson-colored battle cruiser, appears near Star Lab. And so it begins again. Can you not feel them? I can. Yes, it is them, the enemy. They have found me at last. Meanwhile, an envoy from the battle cruiser arrives in Star Lab docking bay nine discuss the fate of the alien creature. Well, would you look at that? Uh, did you say something, Maura? Huh? Oh, no, I, I just meant I didn't expect him to be so... Handsome? Good-looking? I meant tall, Phil. I'm just trying to help. Uh, welcome to Starland. Who's in charge here? I am. 
I'm Dr. Maura Cassidy. My name is Andrus of Belshazzar. I wish to thank you for capturing the creature Isu. It's comforting to know that there are others in the universe that recognize the depravity of his crime and will assist in the administration of justice. Now, if you will please, turn him over to us. Wait a minute, wait a minute, back up. I'm afraid we don't know anything about any crimes. The one you want, Isu, claims to be the sole survivor of a great war. And as such, has requested sanctuary. Sanctuary? From a war that never was? I'm not sure I understand. Isu had isolated a plague bacteria against which our people had no defense. He used the threat of unleashing this disease as a form of blackmail in order to further his own twisted dreams of power. But my people refused his demands, and they died within the day. But if what you say is true, then why are you and your crew still alive? We were on a deep space probe when the plague was unleashed. And by the time we returned, all life on our planet was gone. At that moment, we vowed to bring this murderer to justice. That's where we run into a problem. Both you and Isu tell different stories, while each claiming to be the last of his kind, leaving no one to verify either story. You don't seriously mean to say that you equate my credibility with his lies? My job here is to find out the truth. Isu has requested sanctuary, and I am obliged to give him that until his guilt in this crime, or at least the crime itself, can be established. And how long will this take? Uh, a few days. A few days? That's impossible. Well, I'm sorry, but we do have certain procedures for dealing with this sort of thing. We are not interested in your procedures. Every moment that he lives further increases his chances of escaping us. My response to your suggestion is simple. You have five of your hours in which to turn him over to us. That sounds a little like a threat. It's a very disagreeable term. Let us instead call it a strongly voiced suggestion. Oh, but you can't expect us. I repeat, five hours. This discussion is concluded. is concluded. That's the end of it, Commissioner. After that, he stormed out, and we haven't heard a word from the Urkas since then. I see. It's quite a dilemma you've got on your hands. What do you think the odds are of Andrus getting nasty if you don't turn over Isu? I honestly don't know, Commissioner. Well, go ahead and put Stargazer on alert, and have them put three squadrons on standby. All right, sir. Beyond that, I guess the best advice I can give you is just to follow your instincts. We don't want to start a war, but I don't see how we can turn over the last member of another civilization to be murdered. Well, I think I'll stop by his cabin and have a talk with him. Maybe he'll say something that could help confirm either story. Good. Be careful, Mora. And be sure to keep me posted. I will, Commissioner. Charlotte, I'm clear. How long, Andrus? How long until Isu is ours? Soon, Meshach. Soon. We've come too far and searched too long to let him slip away. But how can you be certain they'll release him? Hmm, they're a reasonably intelligent race. I believe they'll see matters our way. And if they still refuse? Then we shall simply take him from them. In whatever way we have to. Both possessed radiation weapons of incredible force, capable of 
capable of wiping out an entire planet. We thought that neither would dare use it. But the Valgisarians did, and we retaliated, and that was the last day. The emerald sky turned red, then black. The ground trembled, and the twisted flowers shattered into a million splitters. Birds fell lifeless from the sky, their golden eyes empty. I then realized that even though my world had died, if something from it could survive, myself, a bird, or even a simple flower, perhaps my world could continue. I don't know, Jerry. I just don't know who to believe. I gather your meeting with Isu didn't help to clarify matters very much. No. But even though he can't prove his story, everything he says seems to ring true. I had the same feeling about Andrus. Arcus to Star Lab. I wondered when we'd hear from them again. It's been two hours. This is Star Lab. Go ahead, Arcus. Dr. Cassidy, we've changed our minds. We've realized that in five hours, Isu could escape us again. We are therefore giving you ten minutes in which to do I'm afraid you're asking the impossible, Andrus. Then the impossible shall be your demise. We regard you as actively harboring a criminal with all the attendant consequences. Release him to us. Your only alternative is destruction. Following the rescue of the reptilian alien Isu, who claims to be the sole survivor of an interplanetary holocaust, Andrus, Isu's pursuer, contacts Starlab. You have ten minutes to turn Isu over to us. Your only alternative is destruction. Stargazer Security, this is Starlab. Please scramble a squadron of Zodiac fighters. fighters immediately. Andrus, our long-range sensors have picked up a flight of ships coming this way. They look to be fighters. Oh, they've made the decision. Very well, then. Launch the assault group. The time of final reckoning is at hand. Do you know what those sirens outside mean? Do you know what's going to happen in another few minutes? There's going to be one of the biggest space battles this station has ever seen. A lot of people are going to die because of you. And you know what? I don't believe you. Not one bit. I think everything Andres said about you is true. I'm sorry for you, my young friend. But you should not despair. For there may yet be another solution. Meanwhile, 10 kilometers beyond Starland, ISA Zodiac Squadrons 1, 3, and 6 rocket into battle against five flights of Belshazzarian fighters. Zodiac 1 and Zodiac Squadron leaders target sighted. Approximately four squadrons, type of weaponry unknown. Activate laser turrets and shooting generators on my mark. Mark. One down. Get him later. 
Permission to come aboard. Permission granted. Well, it seems we've won the war before we've even finished the battle. Call off the attack, Meshack. Yes, Andrus. Zodiac leader to Star Lab. Go ahead, Zodiac leader. Something funny's going on. They're pulling back and breaking off the attack. Hold your position, Zodiac leader, and stand by. Roger. Wait a minute. There's another ship heading toward Urkus. It's not one of ours, and it doesn't look like one of theirs. One second, Zodiac Leader. I'm putting it on the screen now. Oh, no. Isu. Dr. Cassidy, can you hear me? Yes, Isu, I hear you. What are you doing? Too many have died, Marla. And for me, it's the end of the running. Birds. Star Lab to Zodiac Leader. Get those ships out of there fast. Roger, Star Lab. Morrow, what's happening? My God, Jerry, I know what he's planning to do. Remember me, Dr. Cassidy. Remember me. The Urkus. It's gone up like a Roman candle. Or like someone set off a shipload full of antimatter modules inside of it. Losses, Mora. Three Zodiac interceptors. And the Urcus? No survivors. It's too bad. It seems now we'll never know who was really telling the truth. If Isu was lying, this could have been his final, ultimate act of destruction. Then there's always the possibility that he was telling us the truth after all. There's always that, yes. Well, I suppose I'd better file my own report on all this. I'll see you in a few days, Mora. All right, see you soon, Commissioner. Starlab out. Laura? Yes, Bill, what is it? I found these in Isu's cabin. A cassette tape and this flower. They're for you. The tape will explain it. Dr. Cassidy, this crystalline seedling is the last thing left to me. And I leave it in your care. When the time comes, you will know what to do with it. When the time comes. Do you know what he was talking about, Mora? Yes, Phil, I think I do. The crystalline flower seedling. Someday we'll find a planet with an emerald sky and still silver birds. And when we do, I'll know what to do with this. And I will remember. Question of Conscience was written by J. Michael Straczynski and starred Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guest stars Dawes Butler as Andrus, Joe Young as Isu, Michael Bell as Phil, and Tina Holland as Mishok. Associate producer, Ron Thompson. Music director, Tom Rounds. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Assistant to the producer, Jim Cook. Technical consultant, Peter Sky. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen. And so until next week, this is Roger Dressler, inviting you to join us for our next adventure from the elsewhere and elsewhen of Alien Worlds.